For those of you who don't know me, my name is Richard Zygman, and I'm a professor in the neuroscience department. Um, this uh, uh, talk today is part of a series that we've run uh, between our department and the neurology department, and in this case, uh, triple sponsored by the FES Center. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, there's a whole symposium this afternoon on uh, nerve regeneration, which is being held in Wolstein starting at 12, and the program is back there where the coffee is. Um, so this all started with an invitation to Mark Tuzinski to come and, uh, and speak here. Um, Mark is uh, an MD, uh, PhD, uh, he's trained in neurology, he was trained by Fred Plum, which I'm sure some of you have heard of. Uh, we should talk to Dara for a because he always has good Fred Plum stories. Um, Mark was a, um, a medical student, an undergraduate at the University of Minnesota, and then he did his PhD at UCSD, uh, with Rusty Gage, which again some of you will know of. Um, and uh, since then he's been a professor at UCSD in their department of neuroscience, which is a department that's half uh, neuroscience research and half neurology. Um, he's also director of the Center for Neural Repair, and he's director of Translational Neuroscience Institute. Uh, so Mark has uh, received many awards. I'll just mention a few uh, most relevant to neurology. The Silvio Conti Research Award, the American Academy of Neurology. He's a fellow of the American Society for Neural Transplantation and Repair. He got the Sandberg Memorial Award for Brain Repair. Uh, National Paralysis Foundation Spinal Cord Injury Research Award. Uh, the Adelson Award from the American Society for Neural Rehabilitation. Uh, he's a fellow of the American Neurological Association and received the Jacoby Award from them. So uh, Mark's really a leader in the field of neural regeneration. Uh, he is one of a relatively small number of people who have worked on primates, which is obviously extremely important for anything that's going to become translational. Uh, since his graduate uh, work, he's uh, worked in the field of neurotrophic factors, which is uh, what he's going to talk about today. Uh, it's a very uh, important area. It's had a lot of challenges clinically, but he's uh, stuck with it. And hopefully there, there will be therapies that come from it. So his title is Growth Factor Gene Therapy in Neurodegenerative Disease. Thank you very much, Richard. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, let me tell you, first of all, these are not the colors of my slides. There is a projector problem. And uh, we are going to have issues going through this talk and interpreting some of these slides. This, for example, is a PET scan. And <laughs> these are not the original PET colors, but we'll make do as best we can. So um, I'd, I'd like to tell you today about our work on attempting to translate growth factor biology into human uh, neurodegenerative disorders. And um, this is a set of projects that began with basic discovery work in rodent models of neurodegeneration, progressed to primate models, and then to clinical trials. And I'll tell you about the, the, the biological potency of growth factors and why we're interested in their application to neurodegenerative disorders and how we've used the techniques of modern um, um, neurobiology to attempt to discover a method for bringing their potent biology into the nervous system. So th the first application I'll discuss is with regard to Alzheimer's disease and how growth factors might be neuroprotective in this disorder. And um, growth factors represent a potential alternative to the most popular drug discovery approach in Alzheimer's disease today, today which is uh, amyloid modifying therapies. Growth factors work through a different mechanism of act action. They're also neuroprotective in animal models. 
And so they exhibit, at the end of the day, potential synergy with amyloid modifying approaches. So, um, well, we're also missized here. It's not as though we'll have any shortage of challenges today, but we'll make do. So I'm going to talk to you about primarily our Alzheimer's disease programs. Uh, we first examined the biology of nerve growth factor beginning about 25 years ago in animal models. This has moved forward to current phase two multicenter clinical trials, and I believe uh, this is one of the centers for that trial. Um, secondly, uh, we have a program underway uh, toward clinical translation focusing on a different growth factor called BDNF as a potential treatment specifically targeted to the cortex in Alzheimer's disease. And then uh, I won't talk about this program today, but we, there's another growth factor gene therapy approach um, in Parkinson's disease that has been through two phase two clinical trials, <laughs> both of which uh, failed the primary outcome measure. And I'll make reference to that as we talk about the challenge of how we bring growth factors into the brain, a drug delivery problem. <sighs> Boy, this is just a really interesting, these colors, but we'll, we'll do the best we can. So all of this is based on the very potent biology of growth factors in the nervous system. So these were first discovered as a family of proteins that are active in influencing cell survival in development about 60 years ago. And uh, Rita levy montalcini and Victor Hamburger received the Nobel Prize in 1987, I believe, for discovering the first nervous system growth factor called nerve growth factor. And they initially identified it as a molecule that was essential to support the survival of certain populations of neurons during development. And we have subsequently come to learn over the next 60 years that they have ongoing roles throughout life in the nervous system. They're present in abundance in our adult brains. They're actively trafficked. Their, trans their, their receptors are expressed. And they have ongoing roles through adulthood in supporting the function of the intact nervous system. They do things like enhance synaptic plasticity. Uh, they uh, enhance vesicular docking and uh, glutamate release in a variety of neural circuits. There are about 50 known growth factors. And each of the growth factors has effects on spe specific neuronal populations. And we'll talk about two of these growth factors in particular today, nerve growth factor and brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Perhaps most relevant for neurological disease is the discovery in the mid-1980s that when these growth factors were, were um, um, infused into the brain in certain models of neurodegeneration and death, they potently prevented cell death. And this really released a great deal of excitement about these growth factors in the mid-1980s. And it rapidly became clear that they were very intriguing candidates for clinical translation, but that their delivery to the nervous system would be a challenge. And this is the basis upon which their potency is, uh, is exerted. So this is a diagram of their signaling cascades in a uh, review published by Kaplan and Miller more than 10 years ago, but this remains quite accurate even today. So growth factors bind to extracellular receptors called TREK receptors. And when the, the growth factor, the neurotrophin in this case, binds to these TREK receptors, they induce dimerization of this receptor and phosphorylation. And this initiates two, one can oversimplify and say, two major waves of down, uh, downstream signaling in the cell. The first is activation through RAS uh, of the MEK, MAP kinase and eventually Krebs pathway. And this, this uh, results in a set of transcriptional activation events that activate the function of the cell. So this is related to cell function, to neurite outgrowth during development, many potent effects intracellularly. There's a second signaling pathway that arises through PI3 kinase and AKT that counters apoptosis. So this downregulates the expression of, apop of pro-apoptotic genes and increases the expression of anti-apoptotic genes like BCL2 right at the level of the mitochondria. So these are essential downstream cellular mechanisms that activate cell function and counter cell death. And when growth factors are administered to various animal or cell culture models of neural degeneration, regardless of the upstream insult to the cell, these are downstream mechanisms that tend to counter cell atrophy and dysfunction and tend to counter cell death. So as such, they have their candidate therapies for a variety of insults to the nervous system. So in the case of the nerve growth factor program in Alzheimer's disease, this program is based on the observation that nerve growth factor potently prevents the death of a type of neuron that's affected in Alzheimer's disease, the basal forebrain cholinergic neuron. 
So it stimulates the function of these cells in animal models and counters their death, as I'll show you in, in a moment. So the clinical program is based on the hypothesis. And as we're moving into the clinical arena with this, we're still hypothesis testing. Nobody's a zealot about, about growth factor approaches. They may or may not, at the end of the day, show efficacy in human disease. We have to be careful, we have to be objective, and test, test these questions, not prove our ideas. So the question we're testing here is whether nerve growth factor will prevent cholinergic neuronal degeneration or death, and thereby reduce the rate of cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. So this is what we consider, if we reach that at the end of the day, a disease-modifying strategy. It's the same sort of thing we're trying to do by depleting amyloid from the central compartment in Alzheimer's disease, but with a very different type of uh, target. And these are people that have been involved in the clinical translation of this program. I'll note in particular Leon Thal, our former chair who, who died in a plane accident about six years ago, but he was very helpful in moving this forward, and a number of collaborators. And all of this work actually began with my graduate work in Rusty Gage's lab at UCSD uh, more than 25 years ago. And I should, oops, let me go back to these uh, disclosures here. So this has received wide support from a variety of sources, the NIH, the Veterans Administration, Alzheimer's Association, and others. And uh, I founded a biotech company called Seragene a number of years ago that brought the, the Parkinson's program primarily to clinical trials. Uh, and I no longer have involvement, so I'm no longer conflicted. So it was this neural circuitry in the rodent brain that first revealed to us the power of growth factors in influencing cell survival and death. So the model system in which this was first shown by Larry Cromer, Rusty Gage, uh, Silvio Barone, and others consisted of cholinergic neurons in the medial septal nucleus of the brain, so this is the deep basal forebrain, and these cholinergic neurons extend their axons into the hippocampus and, in fact, in the cortex. So the majority of acetylcholine in the cortex and the hippocampus is derived from basal forebrain cholinergic neurons. And the population that projects to the hippocampus are these medial septal neurons here. So an animal model was developed in which this fimbria fornix is mechanically transected. This disconnects these axons from their target, and the neurons here undergo retrograde degeneration and cell death. And these were the first observed effects of nerve growth factor infusions into the brains of these rats at the, times, uh, at the time of these lesions. So this is an immunolabel for choline acetyltransferase. It labels cholinergic cell bodies. And uh, this is the intact distribution in the adult rat. This is the midline of the brain. And if one transects this projection on the left side as it uh, projects to the hippocampus, then the cells on this side of the brain undergo retrograde degeneration and death two weeks later, a month later. And these were the effects of nerve growth factor infusions. When these effects were quantified, it was found that in the control lesioned animals, about 55% of the cells degenerate, but following infusions of mouse or subsequently human nerve growth factor, 90 to 100% of these cells are preserved a month later. This was a revolutionary finding at the time, because this was the first effort in which one could infuse a single protein or provide a single gene and, and prevent what would have been inevitable cell death in the nervous system. And this ignited interest in the mid-'80s in the potential of growth factors to treat a variety of diseases because a variety of growth factors influence different neuronal systems. So there was potential in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease to treat nigral neurons and Huntington's disease to treat striatal neurons and ALS to treat motor neurons with different growth factors. We extended this work to the non-human primate brain. So these are adult monkeys. This is that same medial septal nucleus. We can transect the projection on the right side to the hippocampus and these cells undergo degeneration and infusions of nerve growth factor intraventricularly in these monkeys provide you a sense that there is neuroprotection. And when quantified in the monkey, 75% of these cells die in the absence of the growth factor and 85% are preserved. So again, potent effects in preventing cell death. And over the years, given the interest in this family of proteins, a number of people did various studies summarized here showing that in rat models and non-human primate models, whatever the mechanism of injury to the cell, it could be direct transection, uh, or excitotoxicity, age-related atrophy, all of these responded to infusions of nerve growth factor. In several of these models, there was evidence of cognitive improvement in 
in uh, rodents. Cognition was not tested in primate models. And indeed, it became clear that the normal function of nerve growth factor was to modulate the activity of cholinergic inputs to various cortical regions and gate the excitability of cortical circuits. So disruption of nerve growth factor availability would be predicted to disrupt the efficiency of cortical processing. The first uh, clear thought that people had was that this might be relevant in Alzheimer's disease where cholinergic degeneration is prominent. So all of us here know that this is the most common age-related neurodegenerative disorder. The number of people affected is enormous and there are no broadly effective therapies. The pathological substrates include abnormal processing of uh, amyloid precursor protein with some deposition of plaques, the, the formation of uh, neurofibrillary tangos and hyperphosphorylated tau in neurons, which eventually, combined with the effects of aging, result in first the loss of synapses between cells and then eventually cell death in later stages of the disease. So this re remains a disease of great unmet need and growth factors influence the degeneration of some of the components of neurons that degenerate. And to give you um, another example of the effects of, of nerve growth factor on the cholinergic system, so um, I'm, I'm sorry, let me take a step back. So, so schematically, these cholinergic cell bodies are located deep in the brain and the basiforming cholinergic nucleus, they send their projections throughout the cortex and hippocampus, and they undergo early and severe degeneration in Alzheimer's disease. These cells are sensitive to nerve growth factor, as I just summarized from early studies. This is what happens in the Alzheimer's brain. So this is an Alzheimer's brain staining for these cholinergic axon terminals in the cortex, and this is a uh, uh, age-matched, uh, a cognitively intact individual uh, showing the normal innervation of cholinergic uh, axons to the cortex. So there is this profound degeneration of cholinergic inputs in the Alzheimer's disease brain relatively early in the disease. And uh, I'm going to skip ahead here. <laughs> you can barely see this, but these are the effects of nerve growth factor on the same system in the non-human primate. So this is the normal density of cholinergic axon terminals in the cortex of the young rhesus monkey. Again, you can see these individual lines here. There is a spontaneous degeneration of the density of these inputs with aging in the monkey and following nerve growth factor, in this case, gene delivery to the basophorbrain cholinergic neurons once he's a complete recovery of the density of these cholinergic projections. This is the basis of the neurobiology in thinking that this could be a useful therapy in Alzheimer's disease. But does this really make sense overall? Because Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder in which multiple neuronal populations uh, degenerate. Not just these cholinergic systems, which do degenerate early, but a number of other systems eventually as well. Most prominently cortical neurons, which are glutamatergic. Uh, neurons of the locus ceruleus, uh, the raphe, um, and the dopaminergic projections also degenerate, and none of these populations are nerve growth factor sensitive. So how, how reasonable is it to think that a therapy targeting cholinergic systems would be useful in Alzheimer's disease? Well, one clear answer to that question is the first class of approved drugs are cholinesterase inhibitors. They don't do very well, but they don't physiologically restore acetylcholine function in the brain either. So what about cholinergic systems and their effect in Alzheimer's disease? It, it has been shown that the generation of these cholinergic systems, particularly in early disease, correlates best with the, the, with the severity of, of clinical dementia, with the degree of synapse loss in the first few years. We know that in animal studies, if we block cholinergic function, memory is impaired, and if it's restored, memory comes back. And the normal physiological role, again, for this input to the cortex is to, is to regulate the excitability of cortical systems. So the prediction is that if this system were to be lesioned, that there would be uh, abnormalities in executive function. And that's the type of pattern particularly one sees in early Alzheimer's disease. As a combined contribution of degeneration of cortical circuits and presumably the inputs of cholinergic systems. So for these reasons, it makes sense, at least as a hypothesis, to move forward with a therapy that would target the cholinergic system, specifically with growth factors, to try and prevent their degeneration and death. Perhaps we can do better than the cholinesterase inhibitors. So in the late 80s and early 90s, there was a great deal of interest on the part of pharma companies 
and moving their growth factor therapy into human clinical trials. But it was quite clear that we rapidly encountered a problem, and that was delivery. And that remains the problem today. So growth factors are relatively large and somewhat polar proteins, and because of that, they don't cross the blood-brain barrier. And because of that, they must be administered directly into the central nervous system to reach their neuronal targets. But when they're infused intracerebral ventricularly, they broadly circulate through the nervous system. They cause intolerable adverse effects that, that kill intraventricular infusions as a potential uh, delivery route. When they're infused interventricularly, they cause a migration and hypertrophy of Schwann cells that encase the brainstem and spinal cord. That's a huge problem, as one could imagine. They also cause pain. They also cause weight loss because they stimulate hypothalamic satiety neurons. So to begin to test their effects in the clinic, we have to meet requirements. They have to be delivered into the nervous system at adequate doses to actually have an effect on their target neurons. But this is the real problem. Their delivery must be restricted to just those populations of degenerating neurons. Because if the growth factor spreads beyond them, it will cause these intolerable adverse effects. And their delivery must be sustained over time in a chronic neurodegenerative disorder. So how do you do that? How does one meet those requirements for bringing a protein into specific regions of degenerating neurons in the brain. And I can think of two potential solutions. One is a direct protein infusion, infraparenchymally into the brain, but that's cumbersome. There are problems with hardware, problems with infection, but it's a potential solution. And the other is gene therapy. So I didn't begin life as a gene therapist. In fact, when I was early in Rusty Gage's lab, who was one of the founders of the field of gene therapy in the nervous system, he offered that as a project, and I said, no, I don't think so. It's a tool. I'd rather work on the interesting aspects of growth factor biology. But I came back to it about 10 years later as the problems with delivery became evident, and this presented itself as a potential solution for their delivery to meet the requirements just listed. Broadly speaking, there are two categories of gene therapy, so-called in vivo gene therapy and ex vivo gene therapy. And in vivo gene therapy, we, we take a modified viral vector and simply inject it into the brain. It carries a payload of a gene of interest, and in this case, a growth factor. And, uh, and we are using adeno-associated viruses for our current clinical trials, so they express no wild-type genes. They only express the gene of interest, and they do so for years in, a, in models of non-human primates. So they are an effective long-term means of delivering a single gene with very little inflammation into the nervous system. At the time we began our clinical program, though, these vectors were not available. This, we began this about 16 years ago. Is that right? Yeah, I guess it is. And uh, at that time, available gene therapy vectors would only incorporate into dividing cells. And the problem, of course, in the nervous system is there aren't many dividing cells. And so what we did in that first clinical trial after proof of concept studies in animal models was to take biopsies of the skin and cultivate fibroblasts. Fibroblasts obviously divide well in culture. We exposed them to retroviral vectors, Maloney leukemia viral vectors, uh, which can infect these cells. There are no wild type genes uh, uh, that can cause disease in humans in these viral vectors. They incorporate into the fibroblasts. We can amplify the fibroblasts characterize the amount of their nerve growth factor secretion, which exceeds physiological levels by about a thousand fold, and then inject those cells back into the brain in the region of degenerating neurons. So basically the patient's own cells, which won't be rejected, become biological mini pumps for the long-term delivery of the growth factor. That's how we first moved into the clinical arena with this approach. And that was based on a number of preclinical study, studies in, Romans, uh, in rodents and primates, including this one that I showed you a few moments ago. So when we took a monkey's fibroblast, genetically modified them to secrete human nerve growth factor and implanted those cells into their basal forebrain, and then looked at the cortex several months later, they reversed this age-related atrophy of cholinergic projections, and in lesion models prevented the death of these cholinergic neurons. So after extensive safety and toxicity studies, we began a human clinical trial. So this was a so-called ex vivo, phase one clinical trial of nerve growth factor gene therapy. It enrolled eight early stage Alzheimer's disease subjects. Uh, again, we took their fibroblasts, 
transduce them with MLV vectors to produce and secrete nerve growth factor. And we partnered with our neurosurgical colleagues, targeted this basal forebrain region where they're located in the Alzheimer's brain and injected cells into multiple sites spanning the rostral to caudal extent of the human NBM. And uh, the findings of that first trial that began in 2001 were that there were none of these adverse effects of nerve growth factor on non-targeted systems, so this was safe. There, were, there was no Schwann cell uh, hyperplasia, no weight loss, no pain. We saw a significant increase in cortical 2 fluorodeoxyglucose PET scanning, which I guarantee you won't come up across on this projection system, but I'll show you anyway. And then what we've learned after receiving all of the brains of those patients in the first trial, because they've all died at this point, is that there were unequivocal biological responses to the growth factor. So one of the hypothetical unknowns in this process moving forward was whether the degenerating neuron of the human Alzheimer's brain could still respond to nerve growth factor. Do they still possess the signaling mechanisms with the particular intracellular pathology of Alzheimer's disease that would allow them to show hypertrophy, survival, and neurite outgrowth in the presence of Alzheimer's disease? And unequivocally, we've learned today that they can. So first, uh, well, here you go. These are the PET scans. It's rather hard to interpret, but these were the average baseline PET scans of patients before undergoing gene transfer. And this was six to eight months later can't say much with these colors, I'm afraid, but uh, if we had the proper colors, what we could conclude is that there was a general increase in cortical 2-fluorodeoxyglucose uptake over this time period when the typical pattern in Alzheimer's disease is a reduction. So this increase over time was statistically significant as measured by Steve Potkin at UC Irvine. Um, so we had some indication that we might be activating cortical circuits by the presence of the nerve growth factor here deep in the basal forebrain and stimulating these cortical projections. This is, in, in my view, the most important thing we learned from this phase one trial. And that is even nine years after gene transfer, we could see a classic so-called trophic response to the presence of the growth factor. So these are the uh, basal forebrain cholinergic neurons in this Alzheimer's patient who survived for nine years. This is an implant of their own fibroblast secreting nerve growth factor. And this is a label for the nerve growth factor receptor called P75. And, and this implant is black because it has been penetrated by the axons of these adjacent cholinergic cell bodies. So the, so the, the cholinergic cell bodies are what are labeled black by this, uh, by this antibody and they have densely penetrated the graft of fibroblasts. And this means that the human neurons can clearly respond to the presence of the growth factor and send axons into the growth of the, uh, into the uh, graft, which is expressing the growth factor. This is a so-called tropic response, a classic response of a neuron to a growth factor. It extends axons in what are called chemotropic gradients toward the source of the growth factor. And this occurred in every brain. This was the cognitive testing from that first trial. You know, one, one can draw no enthusiastic conclusions from this because this is a very small sample of patients. It's unblinded. And who knows? Maybe the neuropsychologists knowing the trial were themselves biased in doing these assessments. You never know. Those are the problems with unblinded trials. But here are the data. These were the average rates of decline of the six patients that received bilateral gene transfer in the year preceding nerve growth factor gene transfer. And then these were, there is scores on the MMSE in the first year, the next six to 18 months, and the next 12 to 24 months. And you know, they're not declining as rapidly, but these are uninterpretable data because they're unblinded. We just note this because um, we haven't harmed them. There was the hypothetical possibility that one could uh, overactivate cholinergic projections and disrupt cortical function. And clearly, that didn't happen. So that was enough of a signal to justify moving forward with the program into phase two trials. Ah, but by this time, the tools of gene therapy had advanced. And instead of using cumbersome cell preparation methods, we now had adeno-associated viral vectors available, which we'd simply take the vector solution off the shelf and inject it into the brain. Now, no uh, cell preparation testing none of that complexity. This is hypothetically far simpler and far less expensive. So another phase one trial was done 
using now these in vivo vectors, the AAV NGF that you can't see here because of the color problems. And, the, and this was used as a tool to introduce the, the nerve growth factor gene into the brains once again of early stage patients and in the phase two trial early and mid stage patients. And these AAV vectors have the advantages that they have a very extended expression profile in the central nervous system. They, they continue to express their gene product for at least six years in the non-human primate brain. And for the predicted duration of an Alzheimer's patient's life, that would cover a fair portion of it. They're simple, as I just said. Some uh, viral vectors uh, insert themselves into the host ge genome and, ca and can cause insertional mutagenesis and cancer. Uh, but these AAV vectors are, are, pr are pre predominantly present as extra chromosomal, uh, what are called concatomers of the AAV vector genome. They, they isolate and fold in on themselves in the nucleus, primarily without integrating into the genome. And they have almost no risk of insertional mutagenesis. So they're safer. And again, because they express no wild type genes, they induce no inflammation. It's possible that the vector capsid the, the protein coat of the virus could cause some inflammation. That's still being studied, but we haven't seen substantial evidence of that in the non-human primate brain or now the human brain. So 10 patients were enrolled in a phase one trial uh, at Rush and here at UCSD. Uh, that first trial was sponsored by the company, but that the company is no longer involved in this. And the findings of that trial were very similar to what I just showed you. They were safe. They generally showed an increase in PET scan 2 fluorodeoxyglucose activity. And on that basis, this moved forward into phase two multicenter uh, trials, including here at the Cleveland Clinic. So this is a multicenter sham surgery controlled trial. So this is double blinded. And the patients who are control patients in this trial go to the operating room. They have a partial burr hole drained, uh, drained, uh, uh, placed. And then the, basically the neurosurgeon is handed a note. And the note says whether they're a treatment patient that will go on to have needles passed into the basal forebrain and the, and the gene therapy injected, or they're a control patient and the surgeon will go no further. And here's the problem dealing with the surgeons. They must stand there for the next four to six hours and do nothing. They're not allowed to go onto their computer. People are not allowed to come in and out of the OR. They just have to stay there. And some surgeons wouldn't agree to be in the trial because of that. Uh, and some surgeons agreed to be in the trial and then uh, tried to break the rules. So there was always a study monitor present that would say to the surgeon, no, you must stay. And that's how it was double blinded. So the patient would come out, they could put their finger on their skull and feel a uh, hole in all cases. So this is a 49 patient trial, again, at these sites across the country. It has completely enrolled and there will be results of this phase two trial in 2014 and 15. We have um, some data from the from brains of a couple of patients who have died from the phase one trial that was done. Uh, let me show you what we've learned from that. So again, this is the human Alzheimer's brain. This is the where the basal forebrain is located. And the surgeons do stereotaxic planning on a, a stereotaxic MRI in these patients to uh, identify coordinates for the target. And the target's down there, seeing a higher magnification here. And this is their target. The anterior commissure is here, and they have to inject the cells here. So this is not a simple target, and it's certainly possible to be off target. But this is a patient who came to autopsy, and this is where their, their growth factor was deposited. This is a uh, label for nerve growth factor itself. So the NGF is expressed in this patient three years after undergoing gene transfer. So this is that region on histology now. And these are uh, neurons adjacent to this region, also labeled for nerve growth factor. And the neurons are black. They've taken up the locally available nerve growth factor um, uh, or the gene itself. And these are neurons more, relo more remote from that site of gene delivery. And they're, they still have some nerve growth factor, but they're more pale. So there is this distance effect that the, the, as the neurons are closer to the source of the growth factor, they are picking up more of it. And this is another label for these cholinergic neurons. It's a specific label for cholinergic neurons in this part of the brain. Again, is that low affinity nerve growth factor receptor, P75. And the, this is what that labeling looks like adjacent to the sites of gene delivery. And here's a representative cell at higher magnification. This is at a more distant site in the same brain. And this is a typical neuron. And then this is an Alzheimer's disease control who is untreated. 
So looking at this, you can't say much. You perhaps have a sense that there might be some neuronal hypertrophy in these examples. We could quantify that. And uh, there, there was a, a, a statistically significant increase in cell size. It's only about 6 or 7 percent. Note the y-axis here. But this is typically what we see as a hypertrophic response to the presence of a growth factor in non-human animal models. So uh, this, again, is a classic biological trophic response to the presence of the growth factor. And again, in all brains examined, these are, this is showing you, again, the data from the ex vivo trial, axons persistently penetrated. So the single most important piece of information we have at this point is that these degenerating neurons can respond biologically to the growth factor. Well, we don't know if that will have any impact on cognition. Uh, this is the induction of CFOS, a marker of cell activity. And again, in sites adjacent to the uh, region of gene delivery, there are more cell bodies labeled for, more nuclei labeled for CFOS than in remote regions. So what we've learned in this program is that there has been an excellent safety profile, that gene expression persists for at least three years with this AAV2 vector, um, and that we have these classic responses of cell activation through canonical signaling pathway related to growth factor biology. So this phase two study is in progress, and it will provide an example of, uh, or it will provide us with a sense of the potential effect size of neural growth factor on cognition, assuming we detect any effect at all. But this is a very small trial. 25 patients will have been treated, 24 will be controls. And this is vastly underpowered to show statistical significance. So why are we doing the trial? Why are, why are we doing it in a way that's underpowered? It's basically funding. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, had there been funding to do a larger trial, one certainly would. But this is a reasonable next step, considering that it's gene therapy and that it's irreversible. So something we, I haven't brought up yet, good time to bring it up now, is that when we genetically modify these cells, should there be an adverse event, we can't turn off the expression of the growth factor. This is a permanent on switch. And so we really have to be very careful as we bring this technology into the human arena. And we've done as many preclinical studies as we reasonably can to try and establish the safety of this constitutive long-term expression of the growth factor. But that said, one never knows until one gets into the human arena. There are many examples of that. And so, first of all, ethically, in a sense, we're constrained doing a smaller number of patients as we begin to scale this up. Secondly, there was limited funding. Third, this is invasive. Right? And there are risks associated with it that we can't turn off the vector. So um, it's reasonable at an early stage to say, let's see what the effect size is here. If this is going to have a trivial effect size, let's say 10% on the rate of progression over time, this program probably shouldn't continue. It's too invasive and there's too much risk associated with it. If, on the other hand, it results in a 50% reduction in rate of decline, with this number of patients, we can probably detect that. We can probably see that as a signal without reaching statistical significance, frankly. Uh, the, the power estimates indicate that if we have a 50% reduction in rate of progression in this number of patients, given the historical rates of decline on the ADAS-COG and the MMSC in Alzheimer's trials, we would have a p-value of 0.1 to 0.2. That's enough of a signal. It's enough of a trend to say, OK, this merits moving forward to the next step. And if we don't have that kind of signal, then this, pro this program probably would not continue. We are encouraged by the presence of the biological response to the growth factor. But that tells us little about our ability to influence cognition. So that's where, the, that's where this program is at this stage. In the next year or so, we'll see what the uh, difference in rate of decline is on these uh, clinical outcome measures in Alzheimer's disease and make a decision at that point as to whether the program continues. That will allow for a go, no go decision. Any questions about that? Okay, so that's the nerve growth factor program. That is its current status. That, by the way, was the first attempt to do gene therapy for any indication in the adult brain. So it was somewhat groundbreaking in that sense. Today, after having taken patients through these clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease and in the related program in Parkinson's disease, about 250 humans have undergone growth factor gene therapy. There have been no adverse events related to expression of the gene. There have been a few hemorrhages in these various trials, but there have been no adverse events related to gene therapy and the growth factor and the constitutive long-term expression of the growth factor. 
The more we do this, the more we know what the limits are, what the safety profile is, and that shapes our ability to move forward. Let's see, how much time do we have left? It's 8.48. Do you want to try and? 10, okay. <clears throat> so let me um, more briefly tell you about another program that we are moving, translating currently to human clinical trials that we, if the program, if the data continued to, so to support it, would move into human clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease over the next two years. And this is a second growth factor called BDNF. So BDNF is brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and we will specifically target it to anorhinal hippocampal circuitry. Um, and this, this program is based on the hypothesis that BDNF will protect and enhance the function of anorhinal cortical neurons representing a, another potential neuroprotective strategy in early AD and possibly in mild cognitive impairment, which is the prodromal state to Alzheimer's disease and which affects an equal proportion of people as the number that have Alzheimer's disease and is a population with a very high risk of progressing to Alzheimer's disease. And this program is based on these publications that you can't read, but basically um, through a number of studies, we and others have shown that BDNF is a potently pr protective growth factor, once again, now for cortical neurons, for hippocampal neurons. So the drawback of the nerve growth factor program in Alzheimer's disease is that even if it is effective in preventing or delaying the progression of cholinergic neurons, eventually their targets, the cortical neurons, will degenerate. So eventually, this protected population won't have much of a substrate to act on anymore and surely would, would lose any potency if it occurs in the first place. BDNF, on the other hand, is a growth factor for those intrinsic cortical circuits. So, so our original purpose was to determine whether BDNF would protect cortical systems in models of Alzheimer's disease. And if so, could, could confer long-term protection by, by protecting these cortical circuits. And this program was initially started based on these observations. The anorhinal cortex modulates short-term memory and is the key input-output system of the hippocampus. So one requires an anorhinal cortex to form short-term memory. But this Circuitry is also the area of earliest cell loss and early plaque formation in Alzheimer's disease. So the degeneration of this circuitry is likely responsible for the short-term memory problems that are absolutely characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. Trek B, the receptor for BDNF, is widely expressed in the cortex, including the anorhinal cortex and the hippocampus, and BDNF levels decline in Alzheimer's disease. So this was the hypothetical framework for taking this program forward, for seeing whether BDNF would be protective of the circuitry in Alzheimer's disease. And again, the distinction is that the nerve growth factor program is aiming to protect this modulatory system. The BDNF program could protect the cortical system itself directly. So we uh, published <clears throat> six experiments in one paper in Nature Medicine a few years ago that showed broad effects of BDNF on gene expression, synapse loss, and disease phenotype in a variety of animal models. And I'm briefly going to take you through a couple of those experiments given time. The first was a set of studied, uh, studies in amyloid mutant mice. So there have been a number of human uh, mutations in the amyloid precursor protein gene that have been associated with the early onset of Alzheimer's disease. There is a strain of mice that overexpresses two of these mutations, and the mice develop amyloid plaques by about five months of age. They eventually show a little bit of cell loss in the cortex as well. They're not a perfect model. They don't develop neurofibrillary degeneration, but they replicate the plaque component of the disease. So we took these mice, and after disease onset at age seven months, we injected lentiviral vectors expressing BDNF into the anorhinal cortices bilaterally. Lentivirus is just another efficient vector for doing in vivo gene therapy. Then beginning two weeks later, we assessed cognitive function and then took the animals and did cellular and molecular analyses. And this is a uh, wildly off-color slide that really contains so little information because of the colors that I'll skip it. But um, this shows that in those mice, after the time of sacrifice, again, BDNF was expressed in the entorhinal cortex itself. This is showing the hippocampus in a wild-type mouse, and this is BDNF immunolabeling. This shows the endogenous levels of BDNF already expressed in the hippocampus in a normal adult mouse. This is the transgenic uh, APP mouse that doesn't look that different from the wild type, 
But this is the mouse that received, not here in the hippocampus, but in the entorhinal cortex, the injection of a lentiviral vector overexpressing BDNF. Through its normal input pathways to the hippocampus, the input through the uh, lacrinosum molecularity layer of the dentate gyrus, BDNF is being trafficked into the hippocampus. So we are using the entorhinal cortex as, if you will, a gateway to distribute therapeutically delivered BDNF into the hippocampus as well. And this is one of the features of this program. We can practically target the entorhinal cortex and then use the natural trafficking pathways of growth factors to extend its influence, if you will, to the hippocampus itself. So there is this potential for a transsynaptic effect of BDNF in other circuits. When we looked at learning and memory in these mice, again, because of time, I won't go into detail, but this is basically a spatial learning and memory paradigm in mice. Wild-type mice learn a task relatively quickly, and this is measuring a distance that they swim in a pool of water to learn the location of an escape platform, and wild-type mice learn it quickly. Uh, the APP transgenic mice are impaired on this task. They also learn, but um, the, 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 they all begin on their first trial at the same level of performance, but the wild-type mice rapidly learn even in the first trial day that they can learn the location of the platform. The APP mice are impaired, and the BDNF-treated mice are equally impaired on the first day, but they show a superior level of learning compared to the uh, untreated APP mice on a, very, uh, on a couple of different measures in this behavioral task. This is another behavioral task. It's hippocampal-dependent fear conditioning that uh, measures another form of spatial memory. And again, BDNF improves this form of memory compared to the APP transgenic mice lacking BDNF. On another behavioral task that's not hippocampal dependent, all the animals perform equally as one would predict. If one looks at these uh, transgenic mice and synaptophysin immunoreactivity, the APP transgenics have a reduction in synaptophysin immunoreactivity in the entorhinal cortex and hippocampus. This is improved following BDNF gene delivery both in the hippocampus and in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. So this transport is occurring and appears to be affecting synaptic markers as well in the hippocampus. <laughs> Again, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's a bit disorienting for me to look at these uh, color misrepresentations, but this is, uh, this is a whole genome uh, <clears throat> affimatrix gene arrays that were done in transgenic APP mice compared to wild-type mice. So this reflects the number of genes that have uh, perturbed expression as a result of the APP mutations. These genes are turned on and these genes are turned off as a function of the APP mutation in untreated mice. Mice that receive the BDNF compared to the untreated mice now show a reversal of many of these patterns of aberrant gene expression, as you can tell by the color lines here. And overall, and if you look at the entire genome, about two-thirds of the gene sets that were perturbed as a function of the APP mutation are reversed in the BDNF-treated animals, both in the entorhinal cortex and in the hippocampus. So again, some evidence of a transsynaptic effect in the hippocampus itself. But the BDNF treatment has absolutely no effect on plaque levels, and it has absolutely no effect on cell survival in this model. By stereology, there's about a 20% reduction in cell numbers over these uh, survival time periods. So BDNF is not affecting survival or amyloid. It's affecting synaptic function and transcriptome-wide patterns of gene expression uh, directly. So this is an alternative mechanism from modifying amyloid, and hence my early comment that one could think about this kind of a neuroprotective strategy combined with an amyloid modifying strategy uh, in the context of clinical trials. If we give the APP transgenic mice the BDNF earlier in life at age two months, now we do see a protective effect on cell numbers. So there can be neuroprotection, but the first assays were not sensitive for detecting it. So basically, let's skip through a uh, set of data here that replicates it and that, that gives us the same kind of effects in an aging rat model, in a cell culture model. Let's move ahead to monkeys because the course that we've taken as we think about translation to the clinic is to take things through primate models. And, when, and that's just to give us a better sense of scaling, how we, how we adapt this technology to a larger neural system given 
the fact that the delivery of the growth factor is so key to trying to move the potential of this biology into the human arena. And when monkey models don't exist, we make them. So in this case, we made a monkey model of anorhinocortical cell death by transecting the perforant path in the monkey, the projection from the anorhinal cortex to the hippocampus. When we do that, this is the intact monkey. This is a monkey showing anorhinal cortex after a perforant path lesion. You can see that there's some loss of the large diameter neurons. And treatment with BDNF improves this. And overall, there's about a 90% persistence of cells with BDNF when otherwise only 60% persist. And finally, we took this to aged monkeys. We measured cognitive function, BDNF transport, and again, found the same kinds of neuroprotective actions. This is cell hypertrophy uh, induced in these aged monkeys by the presence of the growth factor. This shows improvement on a spatial learning and memory task in the aged monkey. So based on that whole set of data, uh, we have six different models demonstrating neuroprotective effects of BDNF and, uh, and effects on cellular mechanisms that influence cell survival and cell function. So based on that, this is now in transition to a potential clinical trial. Here's the rub. I showed you how difficult the target was with the NGF program. This target is even more difficult because now we're targeting the anorhinal cortex. This is a structure that's about three centimeters in length in the human and two millimeters deep. Three centimeters long and two millimeters deep. That's a hard structure to try and fill. It's, it's a long, thin structure. Let me show you here. So this is where the human anorhinal cortex is located. And it is this thin ribbon here along the base of the temporal lobe, the medial aspect of the temporal lobe. And, and uh, just as a matter of technique using currently available neurosurgical tools, it is a small structure to try and hit consistently. And the concern is that with current tools, one wouldn't be able to do that. So we are collaborating with Chris Bankevich at UCSF to use MRI-guided gene vector delivery to this structure in the non-human primate. Um, and so Chris has developed an MRI-compatible injection needle. This is being used in humans now for treatment of brain tumors and in a Parkinson's disease trial. And we co-infuse our AAV vectors with an MRI-dense marker called gadoteridol. And, this, and the gadoteridol co-diffuses with the vector so we can adequately measure the spread in real-time MRI as the patient, the monkey, is in the MRI scanner. So we can confirm in real-time that the vector is being delivered to the intended target and fills the target region. This also can allow us to stratify patients in a clinical trial if the targeting has been off. And I wish we had had this tool when we did the phase two NGF trial, because this is really a, a beautiful thing that Chris has developed. Let me show you a movie of seeing the filling here. So here's the MRI compatible needle. This is the anorhinal cortex. And we can confirm that, the, that it has been filled bilaterally in this monkey. Um, and we can do dose escalation, safety, and toxicity studies that are currently underway in an attempt to move this toward a clinical trial. And this is a particularly dramatic example to me of doing this in a monkey because it can show that we can accurately target, that we can fill, and that if we overfill, we have backtracking into the subcortical white matter. And if we infuse a sufficiently high volume, 170 microliters of the vector, we have backflow into the ventricular system. So this is the kind of thing we need to do to ethically justify going into the human arena. We have to give what we would consider an overdosage, a a toxic amount based on volume that actually has backflow into the CSF to see if we have any of those adverse effects of BDNF expression in this case. We've done two monkeys with this procedure in the last couple of months. They're both out to two months. So far, they look fine. They have no weight loss. We'll sacrifice them after three months, see if they have any Schwann cell hyperplasia. But so far, the safety profile looks acceptable. So this is on its way um, to translation. If we can confirm that uh, this is safe, uh, we have found one toxic effect, and that is in about 20% of aged monkeys, uh, monkeys develop seizures. So think about that. If you have Alzheimer's disease and there's a potential of a neuroprotective strategy, but you have a 20% risk of seizures and you have an invasive type of procedure, is this something that you would undergo or that you would ever recommend to a patient? 
This is the era of medicine that we're in now. We have these pretty intriguing new tools coming down the road that offer the potential for the first time to reduce neuronal degeneration, to really change the course of these tragic neurodegenerative disorders, but they are not without some risk. And that's not a bad reflection of where we stand today. There's some promise and there's some accompanying risk. But these are questions that for those of you who are residents, these are questions you will face. These tools will become available in the next 10 and 20 years, uh, certainly as clinical trials, if not as approved therapies. And you'll have patients with these disorders, particularly when you start being independent and treating patients. You'll see lots of Alzheimer's disease. And as these trials are available, what are you going to tell your patients? So this is this new era of molecular medicine where we are trying to take advance or advantage of basic science progress, both in understanding biology like the growth factors and tools like gene therapy to influence the clinical human condition. And uh, you can see we're right in the middle of some of these programs. The development continues and hopefully in the next few years we'll have a better sense of where we go from here. And with that, I think I'll close. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, Richard asked whether a combination of NGF and BDNF is something one would consider. Um, yes. Uh, here's what we can do, though, that, that I think we need to do first and probably the FDA would require first. So, so BDNF has, a, we can hypothetically go into an Alzheimer's patient with BDNF at the earliest stages, possibly even the stage of, of uh, mild cognitive impairment when systems are not so advanced in their dysfunction that it's unlikely that a single growth factor would have an effect. And I think BDNF gives us the best chance to see an actual improvement in cognitive function in a very specific clinical parameter, short-term memory. And so I think that we want to do that first. But if we do that and we do see a benefit, then sure, there are questions of many combinations moving forward, NGF and BDNF to protect both systems. There are new viral vectors that are being developed that we're also developing that may more broadly target the cortex itself beyond the anorhinal cortex and be delivered intrathecally as opposed to passing needles into the parenchyma. And the, it's a wildly evolving field actually with a lot of potential including combination therapy. How do you see DBS as therapy in this Alzheimer's, like a correlation of modulation of network, and the gene therapy is essentially inducing that network again? How do you see DBS as one of the potential therapies for Alzheimer's? DBS as a therapy for Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, well, you're talking about the work of Andres Lozano, so his observation from Toronto that he stimulated the mammillary projection saw an improvement in cognition. I don't know. That's uh, an, another interesting program, and uh, I, I don't know. We'll see how that evolves over time. It, it's certainly intriguing. Yes? So we were at the site here, and uh, we're the number one recruiting site in the nation. Yep, that's right. And uh, it's actually very well tolerated. It was in some ways one of the easiest drug trials we ever did, uh, though, you know, an alternative hypothesis may be Alzheimer's patients will do anything to get well. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, you, you were the, the most active recruiting site. Uh, that was really great, and thank you for your participation. What, did, did you see any problems in the trial? Um, we had one wound infection, but it's been well tolerated. Mm -hmm. uh, patients uh, healed well. Um, they were responsive. I think people understood the uh, nature of the study. Right, so, so this study raised many questions, including ethical questions. How, how does an Alzheimer's patient give consent? That's not so much an issue for a standard drug trial as it is for an invasive trial like this. But there are ways of dealing with that in Alzheimer's trials which were used in this study, including consent of the caregiver. One last question. Has there been any consideration given to um, doing this in pre-symptomatic mutation carriers? Or is the safety profile not good enough? Here yeah, I, so I, I think one needs a, a broader base of, of patient experience to justify doing that. 
So that's certainly the case with amyloid modifying drugs. There is an extensive experience in thousands of patients indicating that the drugs are safe. And so that enabled them to move forward to that. I think we need more of a patient experience to justify that here. Thanks very much.